Benvenuti per tutti gli amici diciamo, che ci stanno ascoltando, sarà il talk in inglese, Isabella eh, viene dal Portogallo nonostante il suo nome in italiano, ok, è Senior Community Manager eh, a Unbubble ed è anche co-organizzatrice di CMX Connect Portugal. <laughs> I hope to... Uh, this is correct, ok. Uh, Isabella vive a Lisbona e ha imparato tutto per pagarsi i conti, ok, per pagarsi le bollette, che è diventato quindi anche il suo stile per imparare cose nuove. Tutto quello che impara per hobby, per passione, oltre che per lavoro, lo fa con questo spirito. Questo talk di oggi è molto bello eh, perché parleremo di eh, community globali Ok, di come poterle gestire superando la barriera linguistica. Uh, quindi, uh, al di là poi degli aspetti che possono sembrare appunto quelli della lingua, ci sono pure degli aspetti culturali da tenere in considerazione per ingaggiare i gruppi locali. Quindi ora lascio la parola a Isabella. Isabella, you are ready? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, this is a little <laughs> Ok, you can start. Perfect, perfect. Thanks, Emilia and Angelo. That was a um, great introduction. I think I understood like 20% of it, but <laughs> I hope you said like nice things about me. Um, hi, everyone. It's a really big pleasure to be here to be talking at ICM's, um, ICM Summit. Um, so today I'm going to talk about languages and growing global communities and how you can um, break those barriers um, to grow your community and to make it even stronger and even more engaged. So um, Enzo already talked a lot of things about me, but to introduce myself, I'm Zabala. Um, I was born um, in, in Brazil, that's actually my city, in, it's called the Brazilian Venice. Um, <laughs> and I've, I've lived in Ireland and Switzerland, and since 2016, I moved to um, Lisbon, to Portugal, to actually to work um, at Ambabo. Um, besides that, my academic background, it's a bit of a mess. Actually, I drop out to university seven times, uh, which I know it's a lot, uh, but, the, but the degrees that actually I spent more time study was visual design, uh, marketing, and right now I'm in the last um, undergrad year of journalism. So hopefully next September I'm getting graduated. Um, like I said, I have five, uh, since 2016 I've been working at Abalo, so I have pretty much five years of experience working in the community management fields. And to have like some emojis to describe myself, you can see and maybe you can guess what is there. And I wanted to also um, give you the opportunity to describe yourself with emojis. So if you're in the chat right now, uh, I will give you like 15 seconds, 20 seconds, and then you can think about some emojis to describe yourself. And then I'll be seeing here. Don't be shy. Is anyone thinking about emojis? <laughs> no problem, no. sir. <laughs> Hi, Francesca. <laughs> Okay, so I can see there are like still people getting in. So, um, hi, Paul. <laughs> hi, Chiara. I like your name. It's a beautiful name. <laughs> Ciao, Alfredo. <laughs> Oh, from Rome. That's great. That's great. I've only been to Milano, actually. So, yeah. <laughs> And only like for five hours. <laughs> cool. So, I'll get it continued. Um, so, basically, what... Uh, <laughs> great, Fabiana. <laughs> um, so, 
basically the work that I've been doing at Ambabo, um, I for, actually I forgot to explain Ambabo, it's a it's scale up company um, based in the US and Lisbon that actually we provide, we combine um, AI with a crowd of translators all over the world to provide multilingual customer support to big brands. So basically it's a combination of machine translation with humans that like do like the final tweaks and then we get to we get to customers like to 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 communicate with their end and their end customers in any language. So basically what I do at Ambabo, it's like it's all about the language over there. Uh, we support 30 language and mostly I manage the European language communities, uh, which is for example French, um, Spanish, Romanian, Czech, Greek, Hungarian, and also Italian. And uh, I'm also the person that loves, loves, loves to add gifts. Uh, actually, in that presentation, you won't see many, but I also, I have a database and maybe like I can share with you in the future. <laughs> Mostly with cats and dogs. <laughs> The the challenge that I faced like throughout my not very long career, um, and basically, like I said, uh, when I was in Switzerland, I was working with uh, Isaac, which maybe some of you uh, might know. It's uh, an NGO organization that provides leadership opportunities and also volunteering uh, opportunities um, to the youth. And while I was working in Isaac in Switzerland as a head of marketing and PR, um, the first challenge that I faced there was the cultural outlook. Um, in which sense? Before moving to um, before moving to Switzerland, I actually got to live in um, in other countries, and also I got the opportunity, thankfully, to travel a lot back in the time that we could freely travel. But soon that time will be back. Um, and mostly the challenge in Switzerland is actually your neighbor country. So you may know um, what is it about there. It's that we have four official languages there. And to localize this, the, the, the content strategy, the communication strategy across all the eight offices that we are in there was pretty challenging, especially because they, um, except for the that I was working, all the people that were working with me were volunteers. So we also like need to rely on their time and also in their motivation. So imagine like um, for eight offices, create a different, um, create the same strategy, but having to uh, localize with the office in Geneva, which is different than the, uh, with the office in Zurich, which is different than the office in Lugano. So that was pretty challenging for me, like to deal with this, like loads of languages. Um, and also like the, the tight resources that we have. So that actually helped um, to, um, to get me the flexibility to adapt, especially when it comes about the growth mindset. So before, before working there, I was also like working um, for Isaac in other countries, namely Brazil, that the growth mindset is different. So one thing that uh, I learned a lot from there is that you may think that like some strategies, um, because it worked really well in a certain territory, in a certain country, it doesn't mean that it will necessarily work in another place. Because people are different, people might receive um, things different. Doesn't mean that you don't need to try, but you also need to be careful, especially when you are like coming from one place and working from um, working to an international company that has um, different strategies and different way of thinking as you. So you need to be super flexible to adapt. Um, the second challenge that I faced was at Ambabo actually. When I joined Ambabo, uh, we worked. 30 employers pretty much and now we are almost 200 and separated in eight offices in both us and also um here in portugal so as the business scaled the community had to scale as well because we got more customers we got more translation uh, translation requests we opened more um we started to support more languages when and joined we were supporting 26 and actually um across those five years we we added four more and we're still like on the on the routes to add more language and the community um there, the community in, in, in Ambabo itself, it's measured, the maturity of the community, it's based on the work demand. 
So for example, in the communities that we do have more customer uh, demand, that we have more customer requesting translations, is the community that we treat as strategic, let's say. Uh, and the communities that actually we do have less customers, but it still makes sense to keep, and it still makes sense to keep those people, our, translation, uh, our translators engaged, is the community that we call as nurturing, because it's like a small community that you may not have more, lots of work demand, but it makes sense to keep those people active, because at a level, let's say, they're pretty much the, the thing that would make people motivated and come to a platform, it's to have work. If they don't have work, we need to think about other strategies when it comes about the gamification and content to keep those people um, active in the platform. So we don't need to get more a lot of costs when it comes about acquiring um, more um, translators. So um, I try to be very brief about the challenge because I really want to focus on how to solve that. I may not have, and I'm still finding the answers uh, for all of the challenges I've been facing, but I hope those ones that I found will help you. And I found actually six. Um, the first one would be um, to whom you are talking about. And what do I mean by that? Um, so there is like this large division and when you think about communities you can pretty much divide into two types of communities there are actually more um more ways to divide the the two ones that i like to that i like to mention is the community of purpose and the community of practice clearly in a business speaking, or at least in the case of Mbabo, um, our community is a community of practice. People can go there because of work. So there's a lot of members' expectations that we have to, ma do, to manage. Um, and when it comes about going global, our, our members need to see the value of expanding. So if you have a local community of, um, for example, I skateboard. Um, so if you have a local community that goes every weekend to, to skateboard in Lisbon, um, for me, it's more important to get to know people who are like in this uh, in Lisbon, who are in the neighbors' um, cities, rather than knowing in that case people who are from another countries, people who are from um, another continent, because I might not have the opportunity to skateboard with them. So it's to understand what's your community for, and based on that, get to know what are like the personas that you want to reach. And in that case, if you still want to go global. Uh, maybe consider to create chapters so they could be um, independently managed and you would still have your brand. Um, again, coming back to the example of skateboarding, there is um, there is a global movement called um, longboard um, longboard longboard grill longboard girls grill. Oh my god. Um, and so actually there's like a it's it's a it's a movement that started in Argentina and now it's expanded to all over the world but how they expanded that by creating local chapters so it's there's still a global brand in the middle but it's locally managed um, one example that I found, like at Ambabo, we do have, uh, we're actually one of the cases that we have, we have pretty successful um, case when it comes about Facebook groups. Not everyone is uh, actually lucky to have that, at least as far as from the people I talk to. Um, there was this case of one of the translators um, that was living in Japan, but couldn't speak Japanese or just know like a few words and actually posted in our groups, uh, in our group, how uh, they would deal with taxes in Japan. And what happened here, and actually one thing that caught my attention is that say that person could have, I mean, we actually don't know if that person uh, speak, speaks um, fluently Japanese or not, or it's just like based in Japan, but it translates to another language. But this person could totally go, I mean, since it's a, it's a case of taxes in a country, so it only matters for the people in that country. But it's, the person still took um, took the took the care of writing this in English because it might be the case of foreigners that lives in Japan, for example, and may face the, the the same issues. We know how taxes are complicated, and if you imagine how taxes can be complicated in a foreign language, that's even worse. Um, that, that's what that um, that was a really nice example that I found. The second learning is, and for me, this is like one of the very, very, very important ones. Learn about cultures. 
not necessarily languages. Language, of course, it helps you a lot to understand context, to understand ideas, to understand what are just like people talking on the street, um, and to help a lot to get integrated to. But not necessarily, it means that you learn about the culture. For example, I speak uh, Brazilian Portuguese, which is actually the same language, just with some um, differences with uh, European Portuguese. I could understand what people were talking about here, but there are some words that are different, but there are some contexts that I don't understand. There is still, so for example, I study in a Portuguese university and they say, oh, do you remember that ad uh, on the TV in 2007? And people, everyone remembers that, but I was not here in 2007, so how could I remember? So language, of course, it's important, but it's not everything. So getting to know about historical facts, getting to know about the econ um, economic, the political um, scene in that, in, in the certain country or in the certain community that you, that you manage, it's extremely, extremely important. And that it's even important, even though you already know the language. And, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> um, how can you educate yourself with that? Um, one thing that I like to do a lot, and especially not only related with the language, it's talk with people that similar demographics as my audience, or even like talking with people that um, that are just like a bit outside of your like circle of friends. For example, once I was I was counting counting how many friends I had, and I realized that all the people that I know and that I have as a close friend are either 10 years uh, older than me or five years younger, and I'm 27 years old. So if I have to, um, in, in, the, in the translation community, in our community, that's actually the age and the gender, it's very diverse. So if I want to reach out that stay at, mom, um, stay at home mom um, that like does translation, that retired translator that just started to work and that just discovered technology and is working in a bubble, I don't know how to reach out to them because I don't have contact with people that are 50 years old. So actually, if, uh, if you still have this language barrier with your audience, but you know people with a similar age, with a similar preference that you can communicate, talk to them. So you can get like really, really great insights. Read the news, that's pretty basic uh, and something that you definitely can't miss. And the last would be traveling for now. It's not possible, um, but it actually helps a lot like to broaden like your horizons and understand better um, how the things work in, in different countries and in different ways. Uh, and here I also added some um, some more examples. So like in pr more in more practicalities, um, I said, yeah, you don't need to learn the, the language. Yes, that's true. If you don't want to and if you don't have the time, uh, if you don't have the brain space, that's completely fine. But you know what you can still do is learn some basic readings. So for example, if you haven't noticed, I started my presentation with Chao and I, I, I added a Vabene over there. So I took the care because I was presenting for mostly an Italian audience. Uh, to get some things that people would feel that uh, I am familiar with them, even though I don't speak the language. Um, definitely celebrate their victories, but also empathize with their sorrows. So there is a lot of moments that you can actually engage with, their, with the community, even though we don't speak the language, um, that will also bring them together. So if they want the Eurovision, I'm like the biggest fan of Eurovision ever. I hope you can also, I hope I can also find more Eurovision fans over here. Um, the World Cup and even like the bad, um, the bad happenings that happened, the, the the spread of the pandemic, the disasters that we've seen, we can also empathize. It's not like you say, oh, but, oh my God, but I'm going to message them and they will feel that like it's super marketing-ish and I'm just like messaging because uh, with like second intentions. No, people really, really appreciate when you take the time like to talk to them, um, even though they can't fully understand. Um, check local and national festivities calendar. Um, of course, it's also nice to validate with someone that's like from that region or from that culture because there might be a lot of uh, 
um, festivities that not, they not really celebrate, um, but there are some that you can't miss. So, for example, in Switzerland, uh, it's because I lived there, and my actually my colleagues didn't know the first of August here, it's with, which is the the Swiss national day. It's a big thing in Switzerland. And when I say, oh, I have to message um, the, the French and the German communities for the people who are located in Switzerland, they say, well, why on the 1st of August? It's like, yeah, because it's a big day. But I only knew that because I lived there. Um, so yeah, that's also nice to get to know and also celebrate those days. And one thing that I find super, super important and people might overlook, avoid misspelling um, people's names and refer to, to their um, on the way that they want to be called. Uh, on the misspelling part, so is, if you are having um, a text-based community, whenever I actually send an email that I forget, that's like, if, there, if I'm sending an email to uh, Joanna with double N or um, Gabriella with double L, if I miss one of the N's and one of the L's, in case I see the email, I will always come back and say, sorry, I misspelled your name. Name is a big, big part of um, people's identity and people's future. So we don't want to mess with that. Um, also, that, that would work as well for when you speak uh, with people. That might be a bit more complicated, but actually I have an example of the next slide that we'll have. And the second thing is refer the way they want to be called. I also work with community support. So every now and then we get um, Zendesk tickets and, in our platform. And I know, for example, if there is an Isabella, that is sending a message. But then the Isabella signed with like, thank you, Bella. I will always reply to, hey, Bella, thanks for your message. Even though I see that's like in the screen name as Isabella, because it's the way that the person signs. So the person somehow wants you to be uh, treated that way. So it's also important to notice that those little things. And like when I said on the misspelling, there's actually this nice, nice feature on, on LinkedIn that actually if you have LinkedIn on mobile, this is not like an ad, but you can record how your name um, is spelled. So when people connect you and the people, they might like see you face to face or like in a call, they know how to pronounce your name, which is pretty, pretty nice. The third one uh, would be to turn your colleagues into advocates. That advice, it goes a lot with people who work with um, business communities. And what I mean by that is that in most of the, uh, it's actually, I believe in one of the uh, latest uh, community roundtable um, reports, uh, the majority of the community manager are actually an army of one. So they are the only community manager in their company or in their organization. So um, it's important to get your colleagues, uh, your teammates from other teams, let's say, to get to know what you do, show your work, um, and actually be open. There's, there's actually a book that's called Show Your Work that I truly recommend you um, to, to have a look on that. It's actually, I, I put in the link in the end of the presentation. And be open to get to know other people's day-to-day -day work. Uh, that might sound weird, but for example, if you go to your engineering team and say, hey, um, can, I, can I shadow you like for, can I have a coffee with you? Can I shadow your work for one hour? I just wanted to understand like how you solve things. They might find it strange, but at least there will be, okay, someone wants to know what I'm doing. And then you, they will find uh, as well the opportunity to ask, oh, what do you do? I'm still finding it difficult to explain, like every, even after five years of, um, of community experience, I'm still finding it difficult to explain what I do and people like to get to fully understand. And even here in the company, so whenever like I'm trying to, to explain the importance of community, what I do is like, okay, maybe you get like 30 minutes of your time, you sit with me and then we can answer some community support tickets. That's actually the best way to get to know the community. Um, the benefits of brain picking, especially if you have a team with international members, Oh my God, like talk to them, like get, like get to understand what I like, the difference, the way you think, the different, the way, uh, the different ways they think as well as their culture. So it's like a biggest benefit that you can have. And um, depending on the size of your company, but actually that pretty, uh, that worked pretty well uh, with both small and big companies, um, propose cross-functional tasks and projects. And what I mean by that, this was actually what happened 
one, two weeks ago, um, I sent a message to our um, customer success team because I had these ideas like, yeah, Black Friday is coming and our editors or translators might benefit of getting some discounts. We do have like really nice clients on board uh, and maybe we could get some discounts. And then I sent like a very casual message to, to, the, to the CS team and their reply was just like, Oh my God, I'm so excited. Let's do that. They even use like capital letters. So I think they were like really excited. And this was just like a really small idea that they could say yes, they could say no, but at least I tried and they might seem very excited. I'm still waiting for those discounts. I gave them the deadline for Monday next week. So let's see how it goes. <laughs> The fourth advice would be context versus full conversation. So, and sometimes that happens when you are like managing your forum, you might be tempted to actually to know everything that your people are talking about, even in a foreign language. So every now and then we actually do get some posts in French in our, in your community group on Facebook. And I was like, yeah, but French is my community. What they are talking about? I don't know. Shall I go to Google Translate everything? The thing is, you don't need to know everything that your community is talking about because that takes time. And depending on the size of your community, you might spend like two entire days or an entire week just like reading through their posts and their like threads on Facebook or Reddit. Um, I think, and one of the like, the biggest um, problems in the beginning of the, any community manager career is micromanagement. Um, because we wanted like to be on top of everything, and especially because most of the times we are only one working uh, on community manager itself. It's like, yeah, we need to know on top of everything. I need to know every detail. And that's the thing. Uh, if you know, and if you took care of too much of certain details, you might not be able to focus on the broader picture or actually the things you can um, escalate and delegate to someone else. In that case, let data talks uh, that talk that like, uh, let data talks um, for you. So for your community strategy and for your business stakeholders. So it's of course I'm not saying here that you just like have to disregard all the conversation because there might be like important things happening there. But the numbers that you can get, the interactions that you get, the number of people of certain regions, of certain language, of certain communities that are engaged, that might be more important. And actually, most of times that's what your business wants to see. They want to get like some nice stories like to feature in their website, but at the end, they want to know in how, how is the percentage of growth of your community and mostly how the percentage of interaction. So don't get too attached with the, with the conversations. And that goes to the fifth. Um, if you still want to know about like the conversation itself or getting a broader context, invest in a moderators or ambassadors program. How does it work? Um, that you can add whatever you want. And so you find people in the community that are, let's say, your superstars that you could, that they could um, actually moderate or taking certain tasks of you, uh, certain tasks of your job, benefiting from the fact that they may speak the language. Uh, we do have that in a bubble, especially because we do get a lot of, um, um, linguistic related questions that I'm not able to help. So we do have those super users that are always with us and we can always construe them and offer them benefits, give them rewards and recognition. Some of those ambassadors, moderators will do that for free just to get the recognition, like a nice badge in their profile or get like some swag box in the end of the year or something like that. They would do because they like um, and probably and that was actually the big, uh, the, the first problem that we have when we launched the first um, ambassador's program here in the bubble. You never find the 100% right person. You never find the person that gets like the highest score in their, um, in their language test. You never find that person that have the availability to be online the entire day. But that person like might like get like a, 70% score in their, in their um, language uh, evaluation, or that person might be available like at night, and then you can still chat like for one hour or two, depending on the time zone that you're in. So, and your moderator program, you never be detailed yet. So you always have people, oh yeah, I want to launch that, but I think they're still missing one thing. 
two things. I don't know. So that's why I want to launch. No, launch it anyway. And then you start to evolve as you are like getting to see the validation of the program itself. And this is definitely a win-win. So you get someone that actually speaks the language and the local expertise, and the person gets a sense of empowerment. And then um, that's, that's a win-win. <laughs> The last one, um, the online communities, it's a big, big opportunity. Okay, Jen, uh, and so I see there are two minutes. Um, on face-to-face -face communication, that might be a bit... Um, people like to have face-to-face -face communication, they might feel a bit shy. And I admit myself, I'm still a bit anxious when I have to speak with native English speakers because I learned English, to be honest, very recently. So, and that's why the online communities can play a big role here because Google Translate can save everyone and the people might feel, may, may feel more comfortable to speaking um, through text. Um, understand the environment of community and the way that the members feel more comfortable to, to express themselves. So you might schedule a meetup on, on Zoom, but then if no one speaks over there, um, but instead they are like super comfortable in going like through chat or, or through your forum. So you might have like this, uh, you might need to have like this sensitivity to understand what's like the platform that works best for your community. And which tools and resources could you provide in case you can to get them like to learn um, better. So there's a lot of online courses. There's actually an online group that's called Speak um, that, that actually you have, you kind of like have to, because it's a way that you also show that you care, uh, you care about them, you care, um, we care about like their engagement with the platform and that's definitely something that will always be rewarded to your business and show them the big pic uh, the bigger picture involve them in something with a common goal and what i mean by that is that actually in 2017 um we portugal finally won the revision and one of the lyrics of salvador sobral was actually in portuguese and we wanted everyone to understand the the song the amar pelos dois and what we did is Actually, we start. We created a landing page. We started to gather like some translations uh, of the lyrics. But turns out that actually people started to reaching out to them. It's like, hey, I translated that to Slovak, and we don't even support Slovak in the platform. I translated that like to um, to Vietnamese and like to lots of language. And actually, in that one, um, we turned with like more than twenty languages. Um, ah, in <laughs> when in doubt, like I said, always go for cat and dog's gift. That's like the universal language of understanding. My gift doesn't work. Great, great, great tips, Isabella. I think a lot of people are here to learn how to make their community international. So I hope your tips ca can really help them. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I see, I, I read so, some. Uh, uh, some uh, comments, uh, but uh, because we have no time, no more yeah. time, I, I I invite you to communicate directly, so you can uh, in the in the last part of uh, our uh, meeting uh, to do networking. Okay, definitely, uh, definitely. Um, thanks, Gra so grazie everyone. mille, <laughs> grazie <laughs> mille, uh, Isabella. And mm -hmm. I hope to see to see there in Italy the the last uh, the next year. Okay. Amazing, amazing. Thanks a million, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.